For the last 41 years, a small, natalie dressed man has walked the football fields of America, from Severn Prep to the Cincinnati Bengals. The man is a living legend named Paul Brown. Brown is a member of Pro Football's Hall of Fame and teacher to 49 coaches currently in the NFL. His coaching philosophy is NFL gospel. In the sidelines during a game, my role is to do the right thing at the right time, the greatest possible number of times. I want it to be as unemotional and as purposeful as we can make it, as succinct. Rufus, we had trouble throwing that because that end was in you right in his face, and he, that's why he threw it a little behind him. Yes, sir. Where's Charles? He threw it a little behind you because he had a, a defensive end, so don't, don't let it excite you. Thank you. The uh, way we operate our offense is to have the coaches call the offensive plays. Right, reverse right, fake 23. Well, the reason uh, I started this idea a long time ago was that I played quarterback myself, and I know just about how much quarterbacks can remember or think about under the press and stress of a game. Nobody can tell me that five men with all the plans spread out in front of them can't get together and do a better job of selection than you can under the conditions that the quarterback finds himself in when he's on the field to play. Everybody has their part to play, but in the final analysis, if there's a decision as to whether we punt it or try a field goal or uh, what we run under certain conditions, uh, the ultimate responsibility comes back to yours truly. Well, the artistry of our business is to do the right thing at the right time, the greatest possible number of times. Somebody has to be responsible for it, and, as the head coach, uh, since I take all the grief, if it doesn't work, I, I want to be in the position where I can control the factors that make or break me. The Brown legacy covers all of pro football. A former Brown assistant, Weeb Eubank, was the only coach to win a world championship in both the NFL and AFL. When Weeb stepped down from the New York Jets, Brown's influence went second generation as Eubank's protege, Charlie Winner, took over. Last week, Winner sent his Jets against the Buffalo Bills with a problem that even Paul Brown lacks an answer to, how to stop O.J. Winner's defense responded by holding Simpson under 100 yards rushing, and Joe Namath solved the Bills' secondary with two touchdown passes, this one to Eddie Bell. But Winner's day turned sour when he made a questionable fourth quarter decision. Passing up a 35-yard field goal that would have given the Jets an eight-point lead, Winner gambled on fourth down and lost. <laughs> Buffalo quarterback Joe Ferguson promptly celebrated with a special play called 54 to the Juice. Following Paul Brown's philosophy, Charlie Winner had made his own decision and determined his own fate. This time, Simpson's blazing speed spelled defeat. The one-point win went to yet another disciple. Buffalo coach Lou Saban was Paul Brown's team captain in 1949. But the most successful former pupil is lantern jaw Don Shula. Shula has done his finest coaching job in 75, bringing the Miami Dolphins back from an early season injury epidemic. Last week, the makeshift defense went after the Chicago Bears. Bear quarterback Gary Huff never had a chance against the new no-names. On offense, there is no question that the Dolphins have replaced Larry Zonka with an average yards per rush up 25% over last season. Hard-running Benny Malone set up his own touchdown, then Bob Greasy balanced the attack with a precision screen to Norm Bulak. In the end, Greasy had it any way he wanted it, throwing for 288 yards and three touchdowns, including one to rookie Fred Solomon. 
With a 46-13 victory over Chicago, Shula has his once decimated Dolphins back better than before, while the reigning world champion Pittsburgh Steelers are just beginning to come around under head coach Chuck Knoll, former messenger guard for the master Paul Brown. Last week, Brown took special interest in his former pupil because Noel was now the opponent. He had brought to Cincinnati the steel curtain defense in hopes of knocking off Brown's undefeated Bengals. The game's first play set the stage for what was to follow. Dwight White left his calling card with quarterback Kenny Anderson and then went back to his cohorts to plan more atrocities. Cincinnati has a defense too. They don't have a catchy name because Paul Brown doesn't believe in such things, but they knew what kind of game this would be if they didn't retaliate quickly. So they came out determined to match the steel curtain stick for stick. For the rest of the first half, two tough defenses went head to head. In six games, Pittsburgh had allowed just 61 points, the Bengals only 70, and the field was no place for the faint of heart. But with eight seconds left in the first half and the game tied at three, the pattern suddenly changed. Steeler quarterback Terry Bradshaw found number 88, Lynn Swan, running free in the Bengals' secondary. And the Steeler offense roared to life. Number 32, Franco Harris, shook off the ill effects of an injured big toe and had his best day of the season with 154 yards of fancy running. Pittsburgh broke the game wide open with two quick second half touchdowns, including a repeat of Terry Bradshaw to Lynn Swan over a fallen Bengal cornerback, Lamar Parrish. Then suddenly the complexion changed once more as the Bengal offense awoke. Charlie Joyner made a pretty move for one score and Kenny Anderson came right back with his most dangerous receiver, Isaac Curtis, number 85. Curtis brought the Bengals close, and then Anderson drew in the steel curtain and executed a screen. Essex Johnson scored to pull the Cincinnati comeback to within six points with over eight minutes left in the game. The strain was beginning to take its toll on the normally stoic Chuck Knoll. Noel knew a loss would leave his team in trouble, two games behind the Bengals. But Pittsburgh turned this dizzy game around one more time. Safety Mike Wagner intercepted two fourth quarter passes to clinch a 30-24 Steeler victory and a three-way tie at the top of the AFC Central Division. For the pleased young student, it was one more lesson on how the game should be played. For the crusty old professor, another problem to be solved in a loss that perhaps some way could have been prevented. For after 41 years of coaching, this extraordinary man who has coached more football victories than anyone else in history still seeks out perfection in a game that he has turned into a science. The rest of pro football continues to look, listen, and learn.